Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. You're very welcome. Great to have you here. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you're very especially welcome. Thanks for joining with us. Uh, plenty of seats up here at the front for folks if you're wanting to find uh, a seat. Just some announcements to begin with. Uh, prayer support is available straight after the service this morning, just in the minister's room. Uh, some of our team will be there if you'd like them to pray with you over anything at all. Our final new members class will be this afternoon at the later time now of five o'clock, five o'clock in the minor hall. Uh, this evening at 6.30, we continue with our mission Sunday as Joanne Briggs updates us on the work of the leprosy mission. And we'll be having a couple of short video updates uh, from the Kurtzmars in Slovenia and from David Vunga in Myanmar. So I'd really encourage you to come along uh, again this evening. There'll be the usual cuppa after the service if you can stay behind uh, for that. Today is our annual missions appeal uh, through which we support our various New Mills mission partners, details of which and updates uh, can be found on the back mission table over here. Uh, envelopes can be found in your free will offering pack and there are spare envelopes all around uh, for any further donations. So thank you again for your generosity in anticipation. Then into the week ahead, our men's five-a-side football tomorrow evening from 8 until 9 in Guildford Community Centre. And then our prayer time on Wednesday evening is at 8 o'clock in the Minor Hall. And then following on from today, we'll have a, a mission focus. Everyone uh, very welcome to that, of course. Little Lights on Friday morning from 10 until 12, NYPD on Friday evening at 7. And then next Sunday, the services are at the usual times uh, at which we'll continue with our current preaching series. We're in the book of James in the mornings and then uh, our deeper uh, book following that book by Dean Ortland. And then in connection with our forthcoming election of elders, uh, you can return your ballot papers into the box in the main foyer today and next Sunday. Just a reminder, we're asking you to nominate up to six names. You may vote for less than six if you wish. And do remember to sign and print your name at the bottom. And then Kirk's session will be meeting on Tuesday week, the 30th of May, to count the nominations and finally to approve those elected to serve. A date for your diaries then, Sunday the 11th of June is Children's Day. We'll be having our service here in the morning and then we'll head this year to Loch Gall Forest Park at 4 p.m. for our church picnic. And we'll give you more details over the next few weeks, but just note the date for now, the 11th of June. And then finally, it's uh, with sadness that I have to announce the passing of John Cunningham on Friday morning after a long illness. And we want to extend our heartfelt sympathy to Anne and to Jonathan and Lisa and to the family circle at this sad time. John's funeral will be here in the church this afternoon at half past two. I think those are all the announcements just for now. I'll hand over to Mark, who's going to lead the first part of our service. Thanks, Mark. Morning, everyone. Don't know what kind of week you've had. Maybe it's been good, maybe it's been bad, maybe it's been sad and difficult, maybe it's been joyous. But listen to these words that describe the one we come to worship this morning. These are from Colossians chapter 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This morning, from all our different walks of life and from all of our different weeks, we come together with one focus, and that's to worship Jesus Christ, the one who created all things, the one who is the head of this body, the church, 
the one who has reconciled all things to himself by making peace through his blood. He is worthy of our praise and our worship. And that's what we're going to do now together as his body, the church. We're going to stand and sing, you're the word of God the Father. Let's worship Jesus together. Young and old together as God's family here in New Mills, and let's talk to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we join together in this place today alongside saints from all across this globe, meeting in homes and buildings, in public and in secret, to worship you as the one true living God. You are one Father, Son, and Holy Spirit whole in your ways and in your will, never changing, ever the same. You are true. Objective truth is found in you. You keep your promises. You're true to your word. You're trustworthy and reliable in all of your ways. And you're living, always active, speaking, searching, finding, redeeming, restoring, comforting and caring, working for the good of your children and for the fame of your son's name. That son who exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of the cross so that our sin could be exchanged for his perfection. The one who is before the father interceding on our behalf and oh how we need that but we confess that we have sinned and fallen short of your standards this week. We have thought in selfish terms. 
We have spoken in angry words. We have acted with utter carelessness, not representing you in the loving and true way you long us to. Oh, how we need our advocate presenting his finished work before you on our behalf, always and ever saying, I have paid the price. Their sin is washed away by my blood. God, may your spirit move in this place today, all day, at every service and in kids' zone this morning. God, for each one of us, young and old alike, will you widen our gaze? Will you help us to understand more about how you are leading sinners home from every tribe and tongue and nation? And will you help us to see the part that we have to play, even if it is small and even if it is costly? God, glorify your Son through all that we do here today, imperfect and flawed as it is. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Lynn, and she is going to come and share with us a little about summer school. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start with hopefully a short video clip which will just introduce you to our theme for this year. Five, four, three, two, one. Authority command to internal. Engines off. Opening main door. if you remember we went on the rocky railroad this year we are going one step further and we are going into space now last year when i did this announcement i was accused even this morning i was accused of emotional blackmail uh, <laughs> because i put up some pictures of crying children who might be upset if we didn't get enough leaders i'm not going to do that this year so Let's talk about our Holiday Bible Club. As I said, this theme this year is space, and we're thinking about shining Jesus' light. So whether we're going through times of sadness, whether going through times of difficulty, in good times, we want to encourage our young people and, and encourage ourselves to be God's light in the darkness. When... Uh, 7th the 11th of August please put that date into your diaries it's taking place in the Campbell Hall as usual and it is for any child who is going into P1 or who is leaving P7 so the whole primary school experience oh this crying adult <laughs> is crying because she didn't think she had enough time for Holiday Bible Club. She's not a teacher. She doesn't get two months off every summer. Don't worry, we've got her covered. If you are only free for one morning, 
perhaps you could sign up to come and tell one of our stories. Come in for 15, 20 minutes at the start of the morning. We have all the material. Come in and tell our children a story. If you're only free on the Monday morning, please sign up for our registration team um, and come and be part of, of our summer school team that way. Oh, it's another crying adult. He's pretty convinced that we have enough people on the team. They're a pretty set bunch. That's hard to be part of. You can't break into that team. Please don't think that. We definitely need more people. Our sign-up sheet is double-sided. So even if it fills up, there's plenty of space on the back. If you've got two or three mornings free that week, think about coming and being part of our kitchen team or help on break duty. Could you sign up to be part of our drama or could you share a class with someone else uh, who was able to do a couple of mornings as well? Oh, this lady, she doesn't like children. Uh, <laughs> And she has no experience working with them. Well, this is actually, she, yeah, she's not great, is she? Uh, we'll take her anyway. By the end of the week, she will love children. These aren't normal children. These are New Mills children. If you are free all week for five mornings, it's not even five days, it's five mornings from 10.30 to 12.30, could you be a leader or a helper? Could you take a class for us? Working uh, through the Bible stories that the children will have heard, worksheets, making craft, you'll be working with a group of eight to ten really lovely children. And this man thinks that working with children is women's work. <laughs> and that only women can be part of Holiday Bible Club. He is wrong. Please sign up. How important is it? for our young boys especially, to have male role models showing their faith, showing that they want to talk about Jesus. If you have no mornings free, if none of that has convinced you, sign up to pray for us. Mrs. Best runs the Prayer Warrior Scheme for Holiday Bible Club, and every year we have, and I know so many people in church are praying for Holiday Bible Club, but be one of our specific prayer warriors for the week. Bake for us. We get really hungry doing all that work. Send us cakes. <laughs> so, finally, why bother if I haven't explained that already? First of all, you get a free t-shirt. And if that's not worth it, I don't know why, what is. It is a great way to get to know our kids in church and to get to know each other. We are part of a church family. Last week, when Mr. Best was preaching about the eldership, he talked about shepherding our flock. And these are our lambs, as we can see in this verse. Always remember my commands. Be sure you teach them to your children. And this is a concentrated week of sharing our faith and our love for Jesus with our children who need to know that stuff. At the back of... Uh, the church this morning, there will be a registration sheet that looks like this. And as I said, it's also double-sided. Please sign up um, for no other reason than if you don't, I'll get up in a couple of weeks and I'll pile on even more emotional blackmail. So thank you for listening and form an orderly queue at the end. Thanks, Lynn. That was just glorious. Uh, I kind of want you to do another announcement in a couple of weeks just for my own entertainment, but hopefully we will sign up. <laughs> right, no more announcements for Lynn, okay. Or certainly no more PowerPoint opportunities. <laughs> okay, the only possible way to follow that up is to read God's Word together to bring us back into, into good sense. So we're going to open up God's Word. We're going to turn to Philippians chapter 1, page 1178 of your pew Bibles. <clears throat> we're going to start at verse 3 and read through to verse 21. I'll give you a, a, a few seconds to find that in your Bible or in the pew Bible uh, that you've got there. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 3, 
This is God's word, and we do trust and believe that he will speak through it to us this morning. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ and to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that is, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. And we thank God for his word together. Boys and girls, it's been wonderful to have you in church up to this point, but you can head down to Kid Zone now. And just so you know, as we are hearing about open doors here in church this morning, the boys and girls down in Kid Zone will be hearing about open doors as well. So please do chat to them on the way home or over the dinner table about what they've heard. Ask them some questions. Share maybe a bit about what you learned and ask them what they learned as well as they heard about open doors. I'm going to hand over to the prayer group now, and they're going to lead us in two more items. Living hope, and then may the peoples praise you.
We're going to continue to worship God as your offering is received. Let's pray together. Lord, who is life and who is love, take these tithes and offerings and may they, like our lives, be consecrated to you. May the gifts given through our mission appeal today be used by those who receive them for the proclaiming of your gospel, for the discipling and the protecting of your people and for the expansion of your kingdom, all for the advancement of your son's precious and life-giving name. In his name we pray. Amen. thrilled to have Chris with us this morning from Open Doors. I'm going to hand over to him now, but I want to encourage you uh, as we go through this. Yes, it's good to give to the work um, of organizations like Open Doors through our appeal, but the, the best thing we can undoubtedly do is to pray for the work. So listen and just maybe one thing as we're going through that Chris shares, um, hold on to that as a point of prayer uh, from this morning. And then when Chris finishes, I'm going to pray for the work of Open Doors as well. So Chris, over to you. Mark told me to make sure I didn't turn that on too soon in case you had to hear me sing. That's why I left it too late. Good morning. It is great uh, to be with you. A uh, real privilege to be back here. It's been a number of years since I was last uh, with you. So um, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you for your ongoing support for the Ministry of Open Doors. And a special thanks to Amy, your brilliant Open Doors church rep. Um, and I'll come back to her at the end. Um, so I want to tell you today about the devastating challenges facing our brothers and sisters in sub-Saharan Africa, and especially uh, those in Nigeria. I wonder if you could imagine a group of 14 people. What would that look like for you as you try and picture that? Maybe it's the size of your child's rugby, football, or hockey team. Or perhaps there were 14 of you in your family when you gather for special occasions. Uh, maybe it's the number of people in your team or your office at work, perhaps the size of your home group, or even the number of people along your row in the room today. With that group in mind, 
Let me tell you that every day, 14 Christians are killed for their faith in Nigeria. That's 98 a week. Or 425 a month. Nigeria, therefore, is at number six on the world watch list, but if it was ranked purely on violence alone, it would be number one. There's the stats from last year, that massive number of Christians killed that never gets reported, which accounts for 89% of all killings in the top 50 most dangerous places to follow Jesus. It accounts for 89% of all abductions in the world each year for their faith. And that 10,000 Christians displaced from their homes is going up all the time as the violence increases. Tiram, Tiram, who's a a counselor in Nigeria, an Open Doors partner, and she was with me just a few years ago in Northern Ireland, she said that every Christian is sitting on a landmine in Nigeria. Nowhere is safe without Jesus. Here's a Yuba's story. At night, we heard the first gunshot. My father said we should all run. My siblings and I began to run for our lives. The next day, we went back home. Everywhere was silent. When we approached our house, I could see three bodies on the ground. I recognized my father by his clothing. I dropped to my knees by his side and prayed. I ran into the house to see if my grandmother was still alive. She was crying bitterly. They asked him if he was a Muslim or a Christian. They killed him when he replied Christian, she said. A few weeks after the attack, Boko Haram sent a list to our village, a list of people they are coming to kill. My family and I had to flee our home. Life hasn't been easy for us. After the attack, I was filled with anger and hatred angry at God, and I had decided to avenge my father's death. Before coming here, I had decided to never forgive. It was all I could think about. Now, I have found peace, encouragement, and hope. I have learned to forgive and to leave everything at the feet of Jesus. And if I am to die like my father, so be it. I wonder when you last wrote or received a handwritten letter or card. Don't do it very often anymore. Why did you write it? A birthday card or a thank you letter? What did you want the person to feel when they received it? How did you feel when you received a letter or card? Well, I want you to imagine this. You're a slave. You're living in a bustling city. You've been up since the crack of dawn. The market stalls are packing up and preparing for another day of trading. Major trade routes that link Asia and Europe run close by. And the city never seems to stop. Endless hustle and bustle. As you walk through these crowded streets, everything around you, the sights, the sounds, the smells, remind you of Rome. Wherever you turn, there's displays of worship to Caesar. And up until recently, you pledged unswerving loyalty to him too. 
But now another king has captured your heart. This is Philippi, northern Greece. It's AD 61 and you're a thousand miles from Rome. You arrive at a grand looking house owned by a wealthy businesswoman and you're welcomed into Lydia's home. This is your weekly routine. Here you meet to pray, to sing, and to read the Jewish scriptures, and you share a meal together. But today is different. Today a letter has arrived from a man called Paul. You've heard his tales of him planting churches across the empire and his visits to Philippi. There's excitement in the room as his letter is opened and read. The content is encouraging, explosive. The words are tantamount to treason. Paul is writing to this brave Christian minority in Philippi, inviting them, encouraging them to stand firm in the midst of hostility and opposition. He's literally writing whilst chained to a Roman guard. And it's about the same time that Emperor Nero begins feeding Christians to ravenous lions and burning them as torches to illuminate his banquets. And he's writing about circumstances and experiences and challenges that persecuted Christians face themselves today. And Paul, in this first part of his letter, has two points that he wants the Philippian Christians to learn. But there are also points that persecuted believers around the world today have learned and that we too can learn to inspire and encourage us today. The first is this, partnership in the gospel. A bit of context, Paul and these Philippians go back a long way. You can read about it in Acts 16, Acts 16 the backstory. It's the first church that Paul planted on European soil. And he has clearly a strong connection and affection for these fledgling believers. It's now about 12 years on from Paul's first visit. He speaks with this fondness. Look at the text in verse 3. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Verse 4, in all my prayers for all of you. He prays for them regularly. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel, They were standing with him. They were seen as workers together. And this involved a prayer support and a financial support and a practical support. In chapter 4, verse 15, we know that this church sent a helper to Paul. Epaphroditus was sent. So they're working closely together. In verse 7, he says, All of you share or partake in God's grace with me. You see, whether in chains or in freedom, what we see in this letter is that there's a shared experience of brothers and sisters combined and united together. Paul always centers everything around this idea of partnership in the gospel, the fellowship of oneness, of being united in Christ. And then verse 8, he says, I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I love you as Jesus does. This depth of compassion and affection for them comes through. So this theme of partnership in the gospel, whilst it's huge for Paul in that context, it should be huge for us still today. What he feels is what we're meant to feel too, to to, to love our brothers and sisters, to care for them like Jesus cares for them to be in partnership, to be in one body, to be united. It should be something we live out locally as you do here in New Mills, but also something that we live out globally. And it's something that our persecuted family, like a Uber, have grasped, that when you stand together, there is strength and there is unity. As I said, Tiram is a trauma counselor in northern Nigeria, and she gets this. She's seen this lived out. She's living it herself today. She says this, we in the persecuted church are like an injured foot. It's bleeding and the wound is open. When you come alongside, it's like you soothe the pain. You take care of the wound. She viscerally understands what it means to partner with Jesus. 
Suffering and persecution have shown that in her own experience. And we are united, bound together because of Jesus. His suffering, his death and resurrection has made that possible. And we must take that partnership seriously, now more than ever before for the church in Nigeria. They are urgently calling for your help. The second parallel to draw from the text is this, the power of testimony. To fully live and die for Christ has an impact. It can't go unnoticed. And the world watch list map shows us this, that the reality and the cost of following Jesus is sobering and grim, but it's also a story of hope. I could talk about the 50 countries on that list and tell stories from all of them that would challenge and inspire us. But as I said, the church in Nigeria are calling for us to urgently help them. We have a global campaign across all of Open Doors countries focusing on Nigeria and sub-Saharan Africa. That's why I'm focusing on that one country today. My friend on the front row went to China 14 years ago, 12 years ago, whenever it was. Maybe you've got a country that's on your heart, and I'm sorry I can't talk about all of them today. But I'm here because you need to do something about Nigeria. And it's really, really urgent. There are over 360 million testimonies that are lights shining in the darkness. And each of them have a powerful testimony of Jesus at work, of the gospel advancing. And so when we hear about the power of testimony in Paul's letter here, we see how God is using suffering for good. And that's happening in Nigeria as well. Paul was himself constantly bound to a Roman soldier And it was no ordinary soldier. It was one of the emperor's own hand-picked elite men. So Paul literally had a captive audience. This man sitting there. What would you do? What stories would you tell of Jesus' work in your life if you were chained to someone for him? And they were stuck with you. They had nowhere to go. What would you say? Well, Paul's conviction conviction of the truth of the gospel in Jesus was so powerful, was so compelling that he tells us it spread throughout the whole palace and imperial guard. This man must have got the message and he told his mates as well. That's powerful evangelism. Next time you're stuck with someone on a, on a bus or in, an, in a lift, think about that. What could you say to that person that would make them go and tell others about it? because your conviction of Jesus is so strong. Paul says, I am in chains for Christ. Not in chains because of what he's done. In chains because he's been put there for Christ's sake. And remarkably, these chains serve to advance the gospel. Potentially hundreds of thousands of elite soldiers who wouldn't have otherwise heard about Jesus are now introduced to him. That's the power of testimony right there. The paradox of it all shouldn't be lost. Paul is in chains, yet his imprisonment opened the doors for new opportunities for the gospel to advance. And it wasn't just Paul that was strengthened. The community of believers in Rome hear about Paul's testimony, and they're encouraged too. He says, because of my chains, verse 13, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So as we hear stories of persecuted believers living for him like a Yuba, we should be inspired to go and live for him too. Persecution is a powerful force. It so often leads to true conviction, a deepening of faith in Jesus, and it serves as an engine, as a motor for the gospel to advance. Uh, Rev- Reverend Joseph Curra was killed by suspected Fellaini militants on his farm in 2016. Fellaini militants, like Boko Haram, are Islamic extremist groups that are uh, uh, kind of active across all of northern Nigeria, often trying to claim back their land, but also trying to get rid of anyone who's not a Muslim. And so just days after this tragic killing of her husband by Fellaini militants, Martina was sat with her seven children on the floor. Their eyes were red 
and swollen from crying, their whole world unraveled. Since the death of her husband, Martina has lived in limbo with no place to call her home. At first, she tried to return to southern Kaduna, where she and her husband were originally from. She says, we had a house in Kaduna, but during one of the attacks, that house was burnt down too. That was the only place we had to call home, but the Fellaini destroyed it. So she returned to Obi, where her husband served as a pastor, only to find that a new pastor had moved into the house, which was reserved for whoever was in the post. So we had nowhere to go. Our only solution was to move into an incomplete building, she says. She worked to create a home for herself and the kids. She shared an incomplete room, uh, one roomed house with four daughters and rented a separate room for her three sons. And that's where Open Doors stepped in. Hannah, one of our partners there, visited Martina and her family. She had good news. Open Doors would like to build the family a home. Martina began to cry. Could this be true? Started building in December 2019. The house was completed in July 2020. And the sturdy house, painted blue, has enough rooms for Martina and all her children. And it serves as a reminder of God's faithfulness, not only to Martina, but also the wider local Christian community who still continue to suffer at the hands of those militant groups. Hannah, the Open Doors partner there, says, everyone who saw the house acknowledged the fact that if there is a man who prays, there must be a God who hears. That's the power of testimony. This this widowed woman and her kids, homeless, provided a, a home by people like you that have prayed and have supported this ministry, enabling us to give us the resources to be there at our point of need. That home becomes a, a, a powerful example of God's faithfulness, of the body of Christ united. It's, it's similar to the kind of story that Paul tells of the way he was provided and supported for by these people in Philippians. It's the same kind of family business, of body of Christ ministry, of us all standing together. But it doesn't stop there. Open Doors partners traveled to pray and dedicate Martina's house to the Lord. It was a joyful occasion filled with songs of praise and tears of gratitude. And Martina could not stop smiling. She sang at the top of her voice, praising and thanking God for remembering her in her darkest nights. I had totally lost hope. I was filled with fear and bitterness, she says. I felt abandoned and rejected, but God has taken away all my sorrows and filled me with laughter and joy. At first I thought I was dreaming, but today it has become a reality. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Open Doors, for being a family and a source of hope to my children and me. Uh, Reverend John, who was the pastor that took over the home whilst the family were away, he has journeyed then with Martina through all of this, and he was overjoyed to see this new house being dedicated to the Lord. He said, today, God has reminded us that he is God. He has fulfilled his promise never to leave us nor forsake us. When their building started, I asked Martina, who is building this house? And she replied, God sent me guardians. They didn't know me, but after the death of my husband, they have become my new family. Reverend John explains that this story, this message has become a theme for them in their church. Each time I preach, I encourage my congregation to hold on, hold on to Jesus, he says. And he continues to serve this community that are constantly under threat of the same kind of attack happening to them. There's still grief. There's still incredible difficulty, but support, encouragement at the time of need has been a source of strength. He says this, I'm so happy because the faith of my congregation has greatly increased. And it is because of this answered prayer. May God bless Open Doors and their partners who are the agents of God's work. I pray he will do the same for you. It's the power of testimony the power of how God is working today. So we see in the text 
that Paul wants to stress the partnership in the gospel and the power of testimony, and it's happening today in, uh, in the lives of people like Martina. But how do we respond? How do we act today? Well, for Ebenezer, Martina's eldest son, this new home, too, was an answer to prayer. He says this, When our father died, I began to think of how I would take care of my mom and younger siblings. But God gave me a message. He said, be still. That young man, suddenly the eldest, the eldest man in his family. Sorry, my dad died last year, so I know where, he, I know where he's coming from. This young man, suddenly the eldest in his family, starts to worry, panic. What am I going to do? How am I going to provide for my mom and my siblings? And God just says, be still. He says this, from that night on, I left everything in his hands and kept praying with faith that one day we would have cause to celebrate. We never imagined we'd have our own home again, but God has done it through open doors. Notice that phrase, I left everything in his hands. Those are words we heard elsewhere today. Ayuba in the video said, I have learned to leave everything at the feet of Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's his hands or his feet. We can leave it all with Jesus. In fact, we prayed in that little room before the service. can't remember who it was. Prayed that She prayed, would we today learn to leave everything at the feet of Jesus? Some of you are grieving today. This afternoon, you're going to have to do that. So as we face our own challenges in our own lives, as we live in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to Christ, are we prepared to leave everything in the hands or the feet of Jesus, knowing that he will work all things out for good, like he did for Martina and Ebenezer and the rest? For Ayuba, it was letting go of the anger and the bitterness towards that man who betrayed his father. For Martina's son Ebenezer, it was fear for the future. What do you need to leave with Jesus today? Ayuba's video ended with him saying, if I am to die like my father, so be it. Wow. Similar to the words we read in the letter again from Paul where he says, "For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Are we prepared to follow the example our brothers and sisters in Nigeria and follow him whatever the cost. It's a tough call. Perhaps you want to pray about that today. Pray with somebody. You've heard that those people are available to pray in that room. Please do that before you leave. But also we can respond in other ways. There's a QR code on the screen and maybe we can have it again at the end I'm not expecting you to get your phones out right now, but on that page on our website, there are multiple ways you can respond to support brothers and sisters in Africa. Perhaps the most um, tangible thing, the most powerful thing you can do is to pray. And uh, there are prayer diaries at the back there that take you through something every day, much of it focused on Nigeria and sub-Saharan Africa. Please take one of those and pray because that changes things in ways that we can never imagine. And we've seen the answers to the prayer already through that story. Um, But also on that page, you can uh, write a letter. And if you want to do it before you leave today, uh, it's the easiest thing you can do. You can write a letter to your MP, direct from our website. You put in your name, you put in your address, and it tells you who that person is, and it it sends the letter for you on your behalf. You can add a message if you want to, uh, but otherwise you can send it. And we're asking, um, we're asking MPs, and we're doing it in the Republic as well, we're asking government officials to respond to this crisis in Nigeria. Because uh, next year, the United Nations have a review of the human rights position in Nigeria. And we're telling them that this stuff is happening and it needs to stop, that something needs to change. Uh, and so this is actively going in at the highest levels of uh, authority. So now is the time to act on this. Please do that if you can, because every letter, every voice really does make a difference. Um, but also you can do something else before you leave today. I asked you when was the last time you wrote a letter. If it was years and years ago, today's the time to change that. 
Um, the brilliant Amy has put out some stations with some cards, blank postcards, as well as some instructions there for you to follow of how you can write a letter to someone like Ayuba or Martina today. Uh, and we'll send them out, we'll get them to them, and it can be a simple uh, prayer, a simple word of encouragement, uh, it could be a, a Bible verse, anything that you can write today before you leave, please do it. Because as family, uh, we want to encourage one another, and you know, as I said, the difference that a letter being received with your name on it, <laughs> how, how wonderful that is. We want them to feel that as well, uh, as, as, as much as we can. So please do write that. And uh, Martina herself, uh, in her story, one of the first things that Hannah, that partner, did was she took along a bag of loads of letters and cards. And she says this, those letters encourage me to know that I am not alone. Anytime I'm sad or my heart is heavy, I pick up the letters and start reading and feel comforted. You can do the same thing for Martina today. So please do uh, take one of those actions. I'll be around afterwards if you want to chat, but thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Chris. Let's just take some time to pray together as church family about what we've heard. Father, we thank you that your word has been opened and that we have heard and thought about the work of open doors and about the, the reality of persecution in sub-Saharan Africa and in particular Nigeria. God, we know that those facts and figures that went up on the screen about those who have been killed and those who have been abducted, they're not just numbers, but they're peoples, they're people and their families. There are those uh, left feeling uh, the impact of those losses. For those 10,000 forced to flee their homes, God, we know that their lives have changed and they're trying to figure out what to do and where to go. God, in the light of all of that, we pray against those Fellini militants, against Boko Haram and other militant groups against the power of evil that they are agents of. God, will you break them down and bring them down? God, more than that, will you turn their lives around? Father, will they glimpse the light of Jesus Christ? Will they seek his forgiveness and will they put their trust in him? Father, we thank you for Ayuba's story for the peace and the encouragement and the hope that he found as he went to that trauma center. We thank you that you brought him to a place where he could forgive and where he could leave everything at the feet of Jesus. And we pray that you will continue to do that through the work in those centers. God, we thank you for the blessing of partnership in the gospel. We thank you that those who receive care from open doors in their own words, experience a soothing of their pain. It feels like their wound is being taken care of, and we thank you for that incredible ministry. And for the power of testimony, God, we think about Martina's house and other projects like it. Lord, will they continue to be a beacon to your goodness and your faithfulness in the midst of those communities? And God, for us, as we have heard those stories, as we have been faced with those realities. God, will you strengthen us and inspire us and embolden us by their experiences. God, as we see their ability to leave everything in your hands, Father, help us to do just the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more item of praise together before we draw our service to a close. Let's sing, Go Forth and Tell.
just to say today would be a good day not to go quickly. Uh, as Chris has reminded us, we have our prayer support just in the room, in the minister's room there. We have our sign up for summer school at the back and we have the letter set out. Uh, so please do make use of what Amy uh, has prepared. Uh, and as you write them, trust and pray that they will be helpful to those who receive them. Now, as we finish off, let's say the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.